Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 365. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there... Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Want to learn more from John Briere about new interventions for treating complex trauma in adolescents and adults? Then don't miss his five-day workshop in Cancun this February. Use promo code JOHN50 at leadingedgecancun.com when you register for his workshop to save 50% on your hotel room when you book it at the same time. That's a savings of up to $1,500. Register today for 50% off accommodations when you book John's workshop at the same time using code JOHN50 at leadingedgecancun.com. New registrations only. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan. And this week's episode is really interesting and I can't wait to share it with you. And it's timely coming on the heels of last week's episode when we talked with Dr. Jamie Marich about dissociation, therapists and dissociation, dissociative disorders. And this week, in continuing that theme, I talked with Dr. John Briere, and let me tell you first a little bit about who he is, and then I'll tell you more about what we talked about and what you're going to hear today. John Briere, PhD, is Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and the Behavioral Sciences at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine and Senior Advisor to the USC Adolescent Trauma Training Center. He's recipient of the Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Science of Trauma Psychology from the APA and the William N. Friedrich Lecturer, Outstanding Contribution to the Field of Child Psychology from the Mayo Clinic. He's the author or co-author of over 140 articles and chapters, 15 books, and nine trauma-related psychological tests. His recent book, which came out in 2019 with Guilford Press, is Treating Risky and Compulsive Behavior in Trauma Survivors. That's part one, but the second part of his bio is his mindfulness work. In the Buddhist mindfulness domain, John Briere is co-editor of Mindfulness-Oriented Interventions for Trauma, Integrating Contemplative Practices through Guilford, and author of three chapters, Mindfulness, Insight, and Trauma Therapy, Working with Trauma, Mindfulness, and Compassion, and When People Do Bad Things, Evil, Suffering, and Dependent Origination. John has been a remote faculty at the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy since 2013, and you're going to learn a lot more about him when you hear our conversation, but we were talking about his upcoming training. So we were talking about, we started off, he and I chatting before we recorded about how he is a mindfulness practitioner. And we were talking about Tara Brock's RAIN practice. Well, I call it Tara Brock's RAIN practice. He informed me in our interview that it actually was originated by McConnell, McDonnell, actually, really popularized by Tara Brock and Jack Cornfield. And I use the RAIN practice a lot when I'm feeling, as Tara Brock would say, caught in the trance of unworthiness. And, you know, so I can really relate to that. But John was explaining to me that, you know, like so many mindfulness techniques, RAIN isn't specifically for when you are having a trauma reaction. And he and Tara Brock together have come up with a modification to that practice that they call REGAIN that he will teach us in this week's episode. And he explains it, how it works, why, when to use it, and how. 
So I know you'll find that really beneficial. And you don't have to be a therapist to use Regain. He's going to guide us all through how to do it and explain it. And anyone can do it. We also were talking about something that I'm very interested in. And as if you've listened to Therapy Chat before, you know that I specialize in complex trauma in my practice and that the work I've done has been with survivors of relational trauma, mostly from sexual abuse, emotional abuse and neglect and physical abuse or physical neglect. And in that work, there are some nuances, some things that tend to come up that John is going to be teaching about at his training in Cancun next month. And I asked him to speak about this a little bit more. His his talk is called Five Clinical Dilemmas, Maintaining Resilience, Mindfulness, and Compassion and Works with, Work with Complex Trauma and Challenging Client Presentations. What we were talking about in this conversation what you'll hear is that there's a dance going on in the therapy work between the unconscious of the therapist and the unconscious of the client. And our material is being activated from our history, just like the client's is. And there are some seriously, let's see, seriously impactful dilemmas that tend to arise in work if you're doing deep therapeutic work with survivors who have complex trauma, there are some things that can pop up in the work that can really derail therapy and cause great harm to the client and a lot of distress and potentially harm to the therapist as well. But John teaches us in this episode that one, this is a normal part of doing therapeutic work with complex trauma. And two, that you can use regain to bring yourself back to center in the session if this happens and keep the client safe and keep yourself from doing something that would derail the therapeutic journey and or re-traumatize the client. And I'm really, you know, I'm really interested in that because I think that in our ways of learning to be a therapist nowadays, we tend to learn these brief interventions and longer term therapy work is not being taught to us. So we don't necessarily know what to do when this stuff arises. So I think if you're a therapist or a trauma survivor, there's a lot to gain from this conversation. It's there's a message of when this when these dilemmas come up, it's a dilemma for the client. And it's a dilemma for the therapist and working through it, moving past it can really benefit the therapy work and the therapist's personal growth. You know, it's we are learning and growing through the experience of being a therapist as our clients are learning and growing through their experience of being the client. So I loved this conversation and found it very informative. And I have asked John if he would be willing to come back. She said he will. And so if we can make that work with our schedules, I would love to talk with him more about particularly the issue of sexual acting out, which we did talk about a little bit in this conversation. I brought up a couple of situations where there were enactments and he gave some some input, some feedback on those experiences. And yeah, I'm excited to talk with him more. But if you are a therapist who wants to learn more about how to stay, I'll say stay grounded, stay attuned to your highest self, stay present, whatever you want to call it, centered, staying with the therapeutic process and not getting lost down a different tunnel of your own trauma activation that prevents you from staying with the work. You should check out his, his books, his trainings. And if you want to do it while on vacation in Mexico next month, as you may have heard at the beginning of the episode, there's a special offer for 50% discount on your room booking. If you sign up for John's training in Cancun, when you register for the, the training in the room at the same time, there's a link in the show notes. So you can 
get that discount from there. All right. That's everything I wanted to tell you for now. Let me see. Well, I will just throw out there that registration is closed for Trauma Therapist Network right now, but the waiting list is still open. So if you missed out on joining Trauma Therapist Network membership, before it closed on January 1st, you can go and join the waiting list and you'll be the first to know when it goes live again in March. And I'll offer a special offer to just the waiting list before I open up registration to everyone. So there's a link to that in the show notes as well. All right. Hope your 2023 is getting off to a good start so far. And I hope you enjoy our conversation. I would love to hear any feedback that you want to share about it. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan. And today I'm so excited to be interviewing Dr. John Briere. John, thank you so much for being my guest today on Therapy Chat. I'm really glad to be here, Laura. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Me too. I'm so excited. I've heard about your work for years, and I'm getting to know more about it through our conversation that we had before we started our interview. But I'm just really excited because I know that you are very knowledgeable and experienced in complex trauma and mindfulness and the therapist self-work. And it's all very much what we talk about here on Therapy Chat. And I'm really excited to kind of pick your brain about concept that I find very interesting. I'll ask you about when we get into it, but let's just start off by you telling our audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do. So uh, uh, I'm an old, straight, white, male, cisgendered talking head that probably people don't even need to listen to anymore because, I mean, how much have you been listening to straight white males tell you about things? But holding that in advance for a minute, uh, I've been working with hurt people for I get maybe 30 years now, I've written a bunch of books and do a lot of research on trying to understand uh, how people who've been badly hurt, and uh, it's no secret, by the way, you can see it on in the internet, but I, I came from a very dysfunctional and, and family. I was uh, hurt a lot, as were my brothers and, and my mother, but two separate fathers. So I, I, I get it on a very deep level, but I think very early on, um, especially when I was living in Canada, I was a graduate student, I was just blown away by how little there was on trauma. And the only material in trauma was talking about PTSD from a Veterans Administration perspective of working with combat vets. And given my anti-war, pacifistic Buddhist nature, I wasn't that excited about that. I've completely revised that, by the way. I've now worked with combat vets a lot because, you know, my own view is whether, however they got over there, if we send them over, we need to take care of them when they come back. And so many of them are wonderful people. You know, it's not their fault, quote unquote, that they got stuck in things that I might, might or might not appreciate. But so the very, just going, what's going on here? This is so bizarre. And then getting involved in a clinic there. They eventually, I was a consultant and then made a clinical director working, trying to supervise a bunch of trauma programs because they were pretty much cutting edge in Canada. Man, I had to kind of really up my game and do some research. It was very bad research, but it got a fair amount of attention because there was no other research at the time. I shudder when I look at it now. Uh, not that I look at it now. So I, I just... You know, and I had to call on my own experience, which is, I think, what we'll be talking about here today, too, because, you know, this is big debate in the field. If you're a therapist, does that mean if you're a trauma survivor, are you a better or a worse therapist? And the answer is yes. I mean, it really it depends. And depends on whether you've worked with it, how bad it was, how lucky you are to have a strong nervous system functioning HPA axis, whether you had a benign person on your side when you're little. Uh, you and I both love dogs. It turns out that dogs and pets in your early years. Mm-hmm. There are many survivors have told us, right, that that was actually in many cases their little bonus office of their people they could relate to. I, you know, and I think that's why I love dogs so much. So I just started out with that, and then I realized no books had really been written on it except for maybe one or two. I was sort of the pet male for a number of leading feminists in the world at that time, Sandy Butler, uh, Louise Armstrong, Judy Herman, you may have heard of. Of course. In their early years, they were basically taking me under their wing in a very kind way, considering they didn't have to do that. And and as much as that was helpful to me, I also felt like we needed to develop a language and a perspective that would work for everybody because these were little siloed groups of people who were working with trauma. I did a postdoc at UCLA on crisis resolution, primarily in trauma survivors, and did a lot of stuff. And now I find myself uh, in my waning years glad, Laura, that you will talk to me or that anyone will talk to me at this point in my life. You know, it's getting kind of sad. But at this point, obviously, I'm even more into reflective mode of the fascinating issues around, 
a lot of my newest research is around uh, social justice issues and looking at how racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and ageism are directly traumatizing to our clients and interfere with uh, all kinds of things, including the idol psychotherapy, since we're probably different genders, ages, cis status, whatever it might be. So, and then the other thing I guess you probably want me to mention is I've just been a, a Buddhist, a student of Buddhist psychology for, I guess, maybe 20 years now. Uh, I've had a heavy duty steady state <laughs> meditator for maybe 15. And I, I'm on uh, this about a uh, faculty for different meditation institutes or, or mindfulness institutes. So I have a lot of interest in mindfulness. I'm a lot of interest in uh, how the interface between the therapist who brings their own stuff to the session, which I don't think is bad. That this is what makes us rich and interesting, but brings their own stuff to the session, interacting with a person who's very hurt. The triggering can go both ways very, very easily. And so my, a lot of my interest in mindfulness, although I just do straight mindfulness teaching out there, is how can therapists develop a capacity to be mindfully aware of their own arising material before it creates problems, but not just in a prevention way, but how can we use mindfulness to and compassion to increase the richness of our work? You know, I think that most therapists become wiser and stronger and smarter as their accumulation of experience occurs. So I think that actually therapy is a mindfulness training procedure. It's an existential training procedure. So how do we, how do we, how do we make the work not only helpful for the therapist, but also for the client, but also help the therapist to grow, which I think is always what's going on. People have said to me for years, because I work with torture and then mm. sex trafficking and abuse survivors and horrible accidents and military trauma, especially some of the heavier duty stuff, they say, why aren't you all burned out? You know, my first amusing question to myself is, how do they know I'm not? But I'm not actually burned out. Be- and I think it's because, like, I wor- I've worked in a burn unit for a long time. And I-, I was really feeling kind of guilty at the beginning of that work because I would leave the burn unit feeling really centered and, and happy that way. And <laughs> you can imagine how easily you could do a trip on yourself about that. But, you know, working with burn survivors has taught me so much. They've taught me so much about the, re- the sort of the resiliency that we have, the fact that even very, very hurt people can do amazing things with. Look, we're, we're so trained to think that our faces and our appearance are important. A lot of the people I see in a burn unit have 50% body burns and deep tissue burns and stuff. They're not going to be able to do that anymore. So then the question is, does that mean you have to suffer? I mean, I know you're going to be in pain, but are there places you can go if that's your experience? And, you know, I've seen fights. Oh, my God, I've seen people who are doing better than I am, who came out of a horrible car accident or someone setting fire to them. I don't even know how they did it, but that stuff is very compelling to me, the richness of this stuff and and how both the therapist and the client are, we're in the same position. And we mentioned this before, but I like to say stealing from Firesign Theater, which is an old Canadian comedy group, that we're all bozos on the same bus here. We're all doing the best we can with the hand we've been dealt, both therapist and client. And I think we're so trained in our clinical programs, which are sometimes not that great, and by the world to think that if we have issues, then we're less than. But if you really think that, then you end up thinking your client is less than, and that's totally not true. And not to mention most of us are sitting there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, going, like, fascinating libidinal complexus to the deep value of maternal interject. And then 7 o'clock that night, we're talking to our own therapist saying, I can't stand it, I can't stand it. You know, which one is us? Well, the answer is, uh, you know, Yes. <laughs> Okay, so that first um, statement of what the therapist is thinking, I don't know what that is, but I know that's like more of a psychoanalytic, like really formal like way of talking psychologically, right? Oh, that's, I, I went through psychoanalysis so I can do that talk, but I, I'm not a psychoanalytic person, but a dynamic relational therapy we could call it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because, but I... Just even like those words, how detached does that sound from the therapeutic relationship, really? And and in the second example, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. That's what we're saying to our therapist. And I'm like, OK, so my therapist is thinking what you said in that first part about yeah. maternal <laughs> interject. I'm like, oh, OK, that's I think, that clinical I, think. Training, I think clinical training produces a dissociative state. I was thinking that while you were talking, it's like we are dissociating to be able to separate from our own experience. The only way we would know how to be able to separate from it is to learn to dissociate from it. I agree with you. And I, but you know, if you think that your activations mean that you're now pathological and you need to figure out how to protect your client from your activations, 
Uh, you know, your client could talk to a computer if they wanted to do that, especially some of the new AI interfaces. Yeah, really. Uh, but if what they want from you is connection and compassion, empathy, all those things which will draw on our clinical training. I'm not saying don't get clinical training, but when they trained us, they forgot to tell us if you do this a lot, your client will feel alone and unhappy. Right. And you will end up being like so many doctors and dentists and lawyers who are suicidal or doing whatever, because what could be nourishing about being a psychotherapy machine where you're just burping out phrases that you learned or you're seeing your client as a manifestation of a diagnosis as opposed to a person? That's so true. So true. And I feel it's like there was something you were saying. I wish I could recall it now. When you were talking before about we think that when our material arises, that there's something wrong with us. And we think that when we are seemingly like seemingly regulated, but I would say maybe even hyper regulated, Mm -hmm. that we're that that's how we're supposed to be. But that doesn't feel relational. So you're kind of speaking about the feeling in the work too, right? Well, we have to draw on all of it, though. I don't want someone I'm supervising or consulting or myself to start bleeding all over my client because they acted, they're clad because they activated some memory of ours. You know, we can't do that, but can we use that run and fight this stuff away? You know, I don't know if you ever, if you remember, or even if you're old enough, Laura, but Ram Dass's books and Ram Dass's training, one of his books was called Risk for the Mill. Mm-hmm. And part of it, you know, this is an old book, you know, but he turned out to be like, I don't know if you followed it, but he turned out to be rubber hits the rose. He was real. He was, yeah. you know, the stroke and all that, that stuff. He's still in there doing it. I know so, more about his story than I haven't. I haven't actually read his books, but I know about his story. Yeah. So Risk for the Mill means that when it comes up, you use it, mm-hmm. whatever it is. But that that's not just like, okay, fine, I'll just hang out there with my client. It, it takes a lot of brain power. You've got to go, wow, that's a serious problem. What do I know from the literature in my training about how to help people with that problem? But what is my reaction right now? Am I kind of freaked out or titillated or confused by what they're doing? Am I now defending against it by being hyper-intellectualized? Whatever it might be, you know, that's all good stuff, but we just have to call on all that. Sometimes people have said to me, so I've written a lot of books, and I guess maybe they could be misinterpreted that I'm saying we should all just be real, hang out, be on. Yeah, actually, being a therapist is the Bodhisattva journey. It's a, such a tremendous journey about allowing ourselves to be ourselves without having some of our uncooked seeds, as Ram Dass would say, or unprocessed material bleed out in session and hurt the client. So if we are mindfully aware of our activations, we can use them. Probably the client won't have a clue that they're going on, but that's why trauma survivors of therapists could be a very good one because they can know something about what's going on. They may not have as many institutionalized defenses against it by pathologizing the center. They can be more, yeah, I know about this. What you're saying is real. That's really hard work. So, you know, I don't really think that nine out of 10 people in the world know just how much work a therapist is going mm-hmm. through. You know, there's an old, in the analytic community, there's an old saying, the analyst's love for his patient is because, well, you know, the analyst's love for his patient is his silence, you know, and there's a lot to be said for that. Like how many times have we wanted to speak a little bit, a lot, and really what we're just trying to do is soothe ourselves. We're trying to feel uh, efficacious when we're feeling helpless, et cetera. Yes. You know, but a therapist and a client watching each other in a benevolent state but not saying anything for a little while, it's actually very powerful work and it's very activating work. If you've ever, like in some retreats, they'll actually ask, I hate it, but I do it. They'll ask you to stare in some a stranger's eyes for 30 minutes. The material that comes up, oh my God, all the things you think remind you of what your little monkey has been chattering in your mind all along when you were interacting with your clients. So how can you be authentic but not be over the top, I guess, or something like that? Right. We don't want to be a robot, but we don't want to be, like you said, bleeding. We don't want to be sitting on the client's lap having them comfort us about the trauma that got activated when they were talking about their pain. No, that wouldn't be good. But I think like, you know, something that you're speaking about is there are these, we hear so much about use mindfulness, teach clients to be mindful, teach them to get mindful about, you know, and when I say them, I mean, I'm a client too. I'm a therapist, but I have a therapist. So I'm a client and a therapist. Mm -hmm. So we're learning to be with what we feel and notice it and, you know, not get attached to it and not follow it too far, which can be really difficult with trauma because you're, you know, your nervous system just is overtaken by the trauma reaction. But so a lot of therapists think teach clients mindfulness and then the client will 
feel better, but it's also not, most of us therapists aren't mindfulness teachers at all. So, you know. So if you, if you just go to my website, I make no money and I'm not getting any ego gratification from this, but just johnbriar.com, you can download a couple chapters where I've talked about how to use mindfulness in psychotherapy. But ironically, I suggest that most of us don't try to teach our clients big mindfulness. We only teach little mindfulness. How can you be more present, et cetera? And you ask them to go to a mindfulness training program if they want to do it or go to it. You know, a lot of us, you know, teaching this stuff and trying to make it free or very low cost for people in socially marginalized communities of people who are impoverished for, you know, whatever reason. Uh, and so I think we call it a hybrid approach. Can you teach a little bit, but then can you know when to hold them and when know when to fold them? You know, do, what should you do there? But I think a point we were talking about before uh, we came on uh, this uh, session is having done this for so long, you know, the, we call it the monastic model. The monastic model in meditation means you sit in a monastery for 20 years staring at a wall and maybe you reach some version of enlightenment. It's not that simple and I want to trivialize it. But the problem here, that's a very masculinist perspective, by the way. It's not relational at all. It's saying you just sit with yourself and you come to these conclusions. And the idea would be that when you do that, then you'd be able to be excellent with your client. Well, I agree. You'd be able to realize arising negative states and be able to do something about them. And you'd be more empathically attuned to the client because you'd be more attuned to yourself. I think all that's true. But uh, I'm fooling around with this notion we're calling uh, mindful co-awareness. And it's can we actually learn how to use our mindfulness skills so that we're mindful while we're still being attuned to another person? Now, a lot of my friends in the biz would say, well, that's how it works anyway. But, you know, ironically, I don't think we learn how to be mindful in the presence of distracting stimuli. It seems see someone as beginning in mindfulness. If they hear a sound, it breaks their mindfulness. If something's going on, it does. Of course it would. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But you look at people in a, say, a retreat for people who have been meditating for 10 years, a car could go by, a bomber could fly overhead. Uh, I was attending a, a silent retreat recently at, at, in Oprah Winfrey's backyard, basically. It's not her backyard, but the, the region around there. And uh, there was some paparazzi thing going on. All these helicopters are flying overhead in this Silent retreat that we were doing out in the middle of no. Prince Harry was probably there, and you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, yeah, it's, and so, but you know, what's so interesting is a lot of us were laughing about it later. That on one level we're saying, "Get that helicopter out of my headspace," but on another level, we say in meditation, "Use it, include it." And so, I think that mindful co awareness is you know, it's a skill we'll work with till we die. Is how can I use my stuff to allow me to be better in touch with your stuff? without and use my mindfulness so they're not blown away by your stuff and then have to use some defensive strategy in my place, which would be to sound too much like a clinician or to get distant or to get intellectualized or to get vaguely punitive or slightly withdrawing. You know, what do you do when your client's screaming at you? You know, we all have that as a trigger, you know, but if you can be mindfully attuned to your own process and mindfully attuned to what in Buddhism we call dependent arising, which is that person is yelling at you because of reasons. They're not yelling at you because they're an asshole or a borderline. All things arise from other things and other processes. And so Donald Trump, I do a meditation in our <laughs> meditation was filled with liberals about can we develop compassionate appreciation for the struggles of Donald Trump? You know, this is very, but when you do that, you immediately see all the stuff getting in your way. You thought you were this uh, fancy mindfulness person. You're having these evil plots, if that's where your politics are. We, can we find his dependent on right? Oh, Renzi, he wasn't, he wasn't born Donald Trump. He was made Donald Trump. And everybody is. So when your client's screaming at you and saying, you're, I want to go back to the good therapist, you're not a good therapist, you're, the, you're too black, young woman, whatever, or whatever it might be, that we don't get so triggered because we go, uh, <laughs> yep, that's it. That's, that's what we're all struggling with. And that's what st I'm struggling with because right now I'm pissed at you for calling me those things. I'm exactly where you are. And that can be very enlightening for us because then maybe we can have some compassion both for ourselves and for our clients. And I think that's a tremendous antidote to the dissociation of clinical training. Clinical training is very, very helpful and I've done a lot of it, but we have to find a way that we use our knowledge. We don't defend against our experiences with our clients by invoking knowledge to protect ourselves from upsetting feelings. Working in a burn unit or I've worked with homeless folks for a long time or working with sex trafficked people, it breaks your heart. So then the question is, is that good or bad? And I know a lot of clinicians that try to not be heartbroken and I understand that and I do too. But I just, it, on a good day, when everything's working right, I don't want to try to sound like I'm special. I'm not. If I'm really lucky, maybe that day I'll be able to call into appreciation of 
how this is so much the human condition and, and how lucky I am in a funny way and how much gratitude I feel that this person is letting me into their world with all of its complexity and how can I not screw it up and how can I manage to find a way inside of the extreme noise of their experience to for them to see me just a little bit not being who they are, are afraid that I am, but the being someone who actually gets it. You know, for a couple of years in my life, I couldn't let people light fires in barbecues and stuff very easily. I had seen so much stuff that if yeah. my partner or friend or, you know, we're at a beach or something, I would immediately not want them to set a fire. Well, you know, they're gonna, but it really points out that this stuff sticks with us and it actually yeah. it's our yeah. own. Yes. Yes. What but is it like? I'm surprising who recently had a miscarriage. What does she do when her next client is talking about how happy she is she has a baby? Or her next client is saying, I, I've had a miscarriage and I'm a horrible person. You know, I didn't do this right. Or, or I'm an inadequate vessel. Or, you know, whatever the things are we say to ourselves. Do we do we defend against that or do we use that? Yeah. I hope I'm not coming across as glib here. When we use it, it's at great cost. Very hard to be a therapist, a good therapist, because we have to do all that stuff at the same time. I was doing, I won't say where, but I was doing a very large thing on camera with huge numbers of clinicians where I was interviewing a man who had committed atrocities in the Vietnam War. And uh, I got a little grief afterwards that I was being too compassionate with it. You know, I understand that. Why wouldn't we sort of think that he'd done some horrible, horrible stuff? But, you know, someone asked me in the room, what allows you to be loving when you're talking to someone who's like evil? And I had to say, first of all, I don't, I don't think there is evil. But then I had to say, because I know that but for the grace of whomever, I would have done that too. The only reason I didn't kill people in Vietnam who were, quote, on our side or the South Vietnamese or whatever was because A, I got out of the draft with great difficulty and B, I've never been in that situation. You know, they call it battle mind or, or the heat of battle. When you're in battle, you know, I've talked to enough people to know it's a whole different world and we're sitting outside that. We don't get what that's about. So when you're talking to a torturer or which I've also done a little bit or someone else, we can you imagine? I mean, I know you can imagine, Lauren, I can see it nodding, but when, when our client is racist or they've done horrible things or they or they just show us who they are and we don't like who they are, you know, that could be an open invitation to the blues, but I don't think so. I think that's grist for the will. Mel, that's saying, uh, here it is. This is the deal. Now, how can I not let my stuff get in the way? You know, and how can I help you, even though you're rubbing my face in our in the evil that bad things people can do to each other and how sad life is and how it's gonna end, you know, this doesn't end well for any of us, I don't think, or very well. How can we enter that stuff? But what's so groovy, and I've been constantly trying to bring that word back, what's so groovy, <laughs> both people gain from that dynamic. But the, the client gets heard and they get that you're getting it, but you're not going, oh, you poor baby, or anything that would be off But But the therapist is growing. And I think if there was like a thing I want for all of us in the therapy world is to realize, realize that this is a massive opportunity that we probably vaguely knew about when we got into this biz, that this is a way to get down to where it's really at. You know, you could go to a monastery for 30 years, so you could just be a MSW, right? I mean, you know, they both are going to be the same stuff, but the MSW actually maybe is going to be able to help other people. And sure, uh, you know. People I know, I hang out with their whatever, the famous people, uh, Tara Brock, Jack Cornfield, all those people, they're doing more than that. They are helping people. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying they're not, yeah. but that's not necessarily true. You listen to some, I don't know about you, but I listen to some people speaking mindfulness and I would, I want to run out of the room because what they're talking about isn't what I'm thinking about because they're talking about some autistic, self-absorbed thing. And what we're actually having to do is send our little pseudopods, our amoeba pseudopods out to someone else, but we know there's, they're going to get shot. <laughs> and how can we be okay with that? And how can we learn and grow from that? And how how can it make us humble instead of snooty? How can it make us engaged instead of dissociated? And then ultimately, I think, I hope I'm not going overboard with this, but how can it actually make our own lives more meaningful? It's just such a gift that we have the opportunity to do. I mean, why are we in this biz? It's not for the money. It's not for the social status. It has to be to help people. Maybe we thought we could help ourselves if we got into the biz, but maybe we can, but not by the way we thought, by fixing everybody else and then feeling good about ourselves. But then working with hurt people allows us to see our own pain and injury in a more benign way and maybe allows us to grow from it. Oh my God, I think I've gone over the top. You're being very kind, Laura. No, no, no. You haven't gone over the top. I'm with you and I'm just thinking about, I mean, there's two things. I want to, I have probably three questions I want to ask you about what you just said. 
the first one's the easiest one. Just for, I want to clarify where, I know there's a meaning that you have when you said to make it like the autistic type of mindfulness. Can you explain, I know you're not talking about autism, the no. disorder. So the original word by autism, even by that? Originally meant that you couldn't break out of your own internal experience. It was later applied to autistic children, et cetera, but autism and in other disorders, quote unquote, or other things, autism just means that you can't reach outside of your own skull. You're stuck in there. The problem with, and I'm really not putting in any way putting down meditation training, which I recommend we all do, but the problem can be that you can be just focused on your own internal experience. One of the major changes in Buddhism was the advent of women teachers in uh, Western Buddhism. And when women came, of course, everybody's different, you know, but women on average tend to be more relational and tend to be more connected with another person. This is fascinating to listen to all the wonderful women teachers out there now, or that's Pema children or whomever, who had their own lives. And Pema had a real life. She was like a secretary and, and had kids and all that I mean, but what that stuff was about was about relatedness. So we sometimes call this relational Buddhism, which is how can you take this beyond where it might be? One of one of my close friends is a Zen Roshi, and I just watch him sometimes. He's brilliant, and he gives wonderful lectures, and he's a great therapist. But I just know what his training was, and you know, it's like, wow, how can you do this? How how are you able to show up like that? You know, and that's coming, I think, from our own wisdom. Mindfulness can teach us how to investigate the human condition. Mindfulness alone, I'm actually getting sick of a term. And you'll find that a lot of us are using it much less than we used to uh, because everybody's using it. And there's, you know, there's mindfulness. It's become mind. over the corporate thing. Yeah. In military, it uses mindfulness now to create what they call battle minds. So if you're mindful, you can kill people without being blown away. I mean, that's not all it is. And I hope some vets aren't going to write me mean emails right now. But I worked with the Department of Defense for a bunch of years, which for a pacifist is a pretty weird deal. But I, I, I wanted to help people who have been stuck in war, you know, and they would talk about basically how their military training indoctrinated them to be non-mindful. You know, it's weird to not pay attention to what their own feelings are. But they were told by their right. sergeants, if you stop to go, oh, that poor guy, he's, you're dead because he just killed you. And battle of mind is a little bit like that. It's about, it's something to increase resiliency. But in the military, it's also to teach you how to do what you're supposed to do with less interference. That all those versions of mindfulness, the ones used in corporate America and make you a better zomboid at your desk. You know, I appreciate it. I understand it. I do it too. But this is about the heart. This is about the heart informed by the mind. And they both have to really be online. If either one's alone, you know, the Buddhist way is the middle path, right? It's neither one nor the other. Yeah. Well, you, there's something that I guess this will go with the other two questions I was thinking about. Thank you for explaining what you meant by autistic there. And how you expanded on that. And so another point is, well, we were talking beforehand about the way you see. So for people who are listening, you're going to be presenting a training in Cancun next month. And yeah, five half days, it's going to be wonderful. Oh my gosh, I know. Mornings on the in the training and afternoons, afternoons and evenings. With your sitting on the sand drinking drinks you wouldn't normally drink. Yeah. And you're going to be talking about these five clinical dilemmas, but they kind of, can you say what they are and how you yeah. see them? Because I think this is really interesting for people who are listening who are therapists too. You're going to be like, wow. Well, yeah, let me set that up a little bit. So I developed something, it was in the, the last book I wrote, uh, which you were laughing about, I can't remember the title, but it's called The Reactive Avoidance Model. And basically what I'm suggesting is that an awful lot of things we call acting out uh, and the things we'll be covering in this workshop one each day are self-injury, active substance abuse, dissociative symptoms, sexualized behavior, including sexualizing the clinician, and angry and challenging behavior directed towards the clinician. So that's one each day. Part of that is for us to really start to understand. I know people understand, but just to put it out there and make it sort of a uh, you know something you can actually look at and think about is that all those behaviors are called borderline or they're called antisocial or they're called whatever. But all of those are just people trying to do the best they can with the hand they've been dealt. If you are, if if someone hurts your feelings and activates girly neglect, abuse, maltreatment, lack of love, you're going to go back into those states. And so we have technical names for all that stuff, but you're going to go back into those early states and you're going to relate to what's going on in the world now as if you were back in that original place. And so that means... Uh, that one of the things that happens is most people who are engaging in, say, self-injury 
both have trauma and attachment wounds from childhood, but they also, that trauma and attachment wounds interfere with their ability to regulate their emotions. And we all need to regulate on some level or another, you know. And if we don't, what happens is we get overwhelmed when we get triggered and, just, and then we cut on ourselves or we, or we drink a lot or, or inject heroin or we space out and, and find ourselves in a dissociative disorders unit or we engage in risky sexual behavior, which risks our, our life, the lives of others, sets us up for increased likelihood of victimization. It was actually non sexy at all. It's, it's, it's just everybody does the best they can with what they know. And unfortunately, a lot of sexual abuse survivors, for example, know about how to react as if if you're a sexual object and to believe that the only things you have to benefit other people and the only gamble with is your own sexual stimulus value and their belief that they can rub up against you and, and feel better. And then just angry and challenging behavior, which we all have, right? I mean, snapping at your partner. I mean, we all know about that stuff. We know how angry sometimes we get in therapy. If you're treating really very hurt people. You're going to be angry sometimes. As a therapist? Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, I, as we talked about earlier before we were on here, there's research out there by Diana Elliott and others showing that clinicians, mental health professionals, have the highest rates of child abuse of all groups, also higher rates of substance addicted parents, all kinds of things. So that means we're walking around with a lot of trigger points. So, of course, when clients trigger us, we get angry. But, you know, I, part of what I'd like to remind us, the reactive avoidance model says none of this is pathology. These aren't symptoms. This is the evidence of the syndrome. These are people with relatively limited opportunities to do other things who are struggling against crushing internal experiences of having been hurt so badly or just trying to do the best they can. So when someone cuts on themselves, they're trying to distract themselves from feelings of, of overwhelmed distress. They're maybe punishing themselves because they're trying to deal with guilt. Maybe they're trying to get people to care for them or pay attention to them because they're bleeding. Maybe they're trying to terminate a terminate dissociative episode. We know a lot about why people cut. But if we really do that stuff, we would say they're not doing crazy things. They're doing the best they can given where they're at. So what's the role of the therapist? First of all, to depathologize and destigmatize that stuff without encouraging it, of course. And then it's to find out uh, what's your dilemma. Because I, when I see someone who's in really bad shape, I just think they're in a dilemma. What can they do given where they're at? You know, okay, how could we get you to a better place? Not by curing you or fixing you, which are very Western medical model notions. But could we give you more skills to soothe yourself, to calm yourself, to ground yourself, to develop what we call metacognitive awareness, which is to start to realize that just because you think or feel that you're horrible and that you have to fight back doesn't mean that you actually, that that's actually true. This is a hard trick for us humans. Could you feel scared and have a capacity to say, just because I'm scared doesn't mean there's danger? It's going to be hard, right? But we can learn these skills and then maybe... And we can maybe process our trauma so that next time we're triggered, maybe we don't have to have risky sex or cut on ourselves because we have enough internal strategies that we can use. But ironically, you could turn any good thing into a bad thing. And some people just go out there and try to teach people little toolkits on how to handle their feelings without, I think, having enough empathic appreciation for what it must be like to be in that circumstance. As a person who was pretty much a major survivor myself, maybe still, but working a long time and I hope I'm a little bit better. I know about all those things, especially getting in trouble. I I flunked out of everything very early on. I got into UCLA totally uh, by the benevolence of others, sort of the affirmative action for the not quite right. I actually had no right to be here in some funny sense. I know what it's like to be out there hanging on a branch, you know, but we all are. Even if you had a relatively good childhood, sometimes still someone didn't pay attention to you. They made fun of your weight. They told you that you get better, great. I mean, who knows what it was? And maybe when you were a kid, uh, you had friends who were mean to you. I can remember eating sand because we were in a sandbox and the little girl told me if I eat sand, she would be my friend. Well, now when I look back on that, I feel such sadness for myself that I was willing to eat sand. You know, so are we all willing to eat sand and are we all stuck in this scenario? I think we are. But the very cool thing about guided introspection and the development of mindfulness and appreciation is there really is a way out of this. Can I just say something? Uh, there's a saying that drives me crazy, but I end up using it a lot, which is that pain is inevitable, that suffering is optional. Have you heard that? Yeah. The idea is that we all had bad things, but if we resist those things, if we don't embrace those things, and if we don't realize that we it wasn't our fault, if we can actually gain a perspective on our own injury, we can be in pain, but we don't have to suffer. Where suffering is a more complex state 
involving self-hate, shame, self-blame, wanting to hurt yourself, wanting to hurt other people. Perfectly logical states, especially shame. Oh, my goodness. But, you know, could we find a way to be a survivor and not think that means that we're a bad person? Could we not resist our empty, lonely, hurt, broken glass in our stomach states? Could we, I don't know what you're thinking, Laura, but I know how that's so hard to get your head around, but could to think about other people suffering and our own suffering, could we actually, though, I don't think I can change your pain, not you, but one's pain, but I think I can change your relationship to your pain, which is if you can feel pain, but realize what it's about and have compassion for where it came from and compassion for how desperate you feel right now or how potentially overwhelmed or how easily you get angry at people. If you could just see all that stuff as the, you know, the, the, the radiation from what happened to you, but not as everything bad about you. That's why I really like, if I don't know if that's the right word, but I like working with really violent, scary, dangerous people. Mm. Given my background, I should be very afraid of them, and I am. But can I, or very, very hurt people, that's why I find myself on burning units or with torture survivors. I've worked a lot in torture. These are all just opportunities. They're locked up in little boxes of survivorhood and pain and trauma. They've been diagnosed. They've been alienated. They've been made fun of. They can't form relationships because relationships are too triggering. You know, whatever it might be. They know that story, and that's the that's the societal razzmatazz. If you mm-hmm. need therapy, there's something wrong with you. If you're suffering, then you must be bad. You must have caused it. And, you know, this is actually trauma is the logical result of the human condition. And if we can find a way to embrace that, you know, like what does that mean? Like that's what. Well, I know we're going to be talking about regain in a few minutes, but one of the parts about regain is to allow yourself to feel bad feelings. Well, what kind of idiot would ask someone who's suffering? to be in touch with your feelings and feel bad feelings because trust me, later you'll feel better. What a bogus thing that sounds like, right? That's why we have to tiptoe up on this. But I know what you think, Laura, but I know from my own psychological state and the people I love and the people I've worked with that you don't get anywhere if you try to push that stuff away. No, I mean, yeah, I might help in the moment, but... The suppression effect is if you push stuff away, it comes back later more powerfully. Yep, yep. And so we're in that jam, all of us, therapists and class. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience, and one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn, it's intuitive, the customer support is second to none. And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. Thanks to Leading Edge Seminars for sponsoring this week's episode. If you're ready to hear more from John Briere about new interventions for treating complex trauma in adolescents and adults, then register for his five-day workshop in Cancun this February and use promo code JOHN50 to save 50% on your hotel room when you book it at the same time at leadingedgecancun.com. That's a savings of up to $1,500. At this unique learning and vacation experience, you'll train with John Briere in the morning, then have afternoons at leisure at an all-inclusive luxury resort on the beach. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? Visit leadingedgecancun.com and save 50% on your hotel room when you register for John's workshop at the same time using code JOHN50. New registrations only. I agree. And and I we don't have a lot of time left, but I definitely would like to give you a chance to do two things. One is I do want to talk about regain, but first, will you tell everyone the five acting out categories that you mentioned that will be covered in your training? You you had a name for them, and I feel like just even hearing the name for it is almost an intervention in itself because it gives you like a way to make sense out of it that's different, at least to me. Well, the thing that I just came up with that a lot of us use now, the few people who are Pay attention when I say it. It is that term is reactive avoidance. So yes. you're avo- what you're gonna avoid anything that happens to you. 
you're going to avoid, but reactive avoidance means basically trying to avoid activated, triggered, early pain. So that can happen to us too, therapists and and clients, obviously. I had the weirdest experience of, I teach classes on treating self-injury per se. When I do workshops, almost every workshop, one or two therapists come up to me and say, you know, I cut it myself. And, you know, it's a very difficult thing because you don't want them to be so disabled that they can't help people cut it themselves. And you would like it to be, I used to cut it myself because mm-hmm. that would mean you've got grip on it. But I'm so touched by that because what they're really saying is, I feel like you, and it could be anyone, but you've seen me enough for me to tell you something I would never tell anyone in a million years. That's good. That's good. Because the more you can not hate yourself for cutting on people, the more you can not be difficult for people who you're trying to treat who are cutting on. Right. And you you created the safety for the person to be able to let you know something about themselves that they probably felt pretty ashamed about. And maybe by sharing it with you, they then have a new perspective on the possibility that that can change for them. I've even had, because I teach a lot, I'm more in the past, but teach in military contexts. I've had so many men come up to me, it could have been women, but typically men saying, you know, John, I did some stuff I'm really ashamed of and I feel really bad about it and I'm getting treatment for it in the VA and stuff. But the way you talk about it, I almost feel like for a second, it's, I'm not completely to blame for the horrible things I did. You know, it's a weird thing. We stress accountability in the Western world, you know. So I don't know exactly where we go with that. You did do what you did and it was bad and people died or suffered because... But it's also true that that wasn't that wasn't some Aristotelian notion of it of essential sin or uh, right. Uh, you know, it was caused by some exactly, exactly. And you can work with the causes. And when you're working with someone who's very badly, who's done really bad things, by the way, you don't just give them a pass because that wouldn't help them. They need exposure to their shame. They need exposure to what they did. They need to understand what they did. But ironically, I'm not interested in that because I want them to have some accountability. I just know that unless they can get in touch with that, they'll never expose themselves to what they're trying to avoid. Right, right. Yeah. So the second thing I was hoping that you could talk about before we run out of time is the regain. Because you, and you've mentioned Tara Brock who I talk about sometimes on the podcast too. I'm a big fan of her work. She's a wonderful person. Oh, I I think uh, she I is. Recommend any, I recommend her her podcast. If you can attend a workshop by her. Oh my. Yeah, well, I'm here right outside of DC and she's in DC. Yeah, she's at DC yeah. Insight Meditation Center. So yeah, I'm, I, I love her. I love her work. Okay, so the deal there is, well, there's several steps to this. The original notion for Regain was, can we work with trauma survivors for them to recognize they've been triggered, allow themselves to feel the pain without judging it or resisting it, but not acting it out? Can they accept that? Can they figure out where it came from? And can they begin to realize that just because they do these things or think these things or have this history doesn't mean that they are X, Y, Z? You know, which is just basically that you don't identify with your history. Your history is your history. What you've done is what you've done. There's a lot of freedom built into that. If you can eventually start to realize that your narrative is about someone who was badly done by, who struggled and has done some stuff through lack of awareness or injury, you know, we don't want anyone to just go to hell and eat the mud. I don't want Trump to suffer. (laughs) I mean, I'm tempted to want him to suffer because he's made a lot of other people suffer in my own view. But there's a percentage in that. So the idea with with regained was can we teach people an algorithm that allows them to bring down distress by ironically being aware of it and can they work with it when they've been triggered so i've been doing that for a while and the original acronym is rain you've probably heard that r-a-i which was developed by mcdonald and then it was popularized by jack cordfield and by tara brock especially and rain is a mindfulness technique and i could go over it very briefly here just in contradistinction but each letter means a different thing. So the R in RAIN means to recognize that you're in some kind of an altered state or in some state of delusive appreciation, that you're somewhere stuck that isn't actually very accurate. Uh, the A stands for acceptance or allow, which is that you allow yourself to be in this stuck place, appreciate why you are, appreciate why you're behaving or suffering in certain kinds of ways. Investigation is figuring out where's the pain coming from. But from a Buddhist perspective, we mostly think the pain comes from our attachments, which are we attached to people liking us, or we attached to being so called pretty, which is a completely meaningful, meaningless task. Are we attached to winning arguments? Are we attached to being a good therapist? Are we attached to being handsome? Are we attached to, you know, whatever? The classic Buddhist understanding is if you could really appreciate your attachments, 
and appreciate that they're there, you could sort of let go of them, which by the way, is very hard. And it's quite irritating when people act like you could just give up your attachments. You can't. I mean, you probably love your kids, right? That's an attachment. So attachment isn't bad. It's part of the human condition. But some attachments do us dirty. You know, uh, in the economic downturn, you have these rich guys coming into emergency rooms with suicide attempts because when their money went away, they thought they didn't have anything because they were attached to money as the answer to everything. They thought no one would care about them if they didn't have that money. So, you know, so attachment has a lot of parts to it. But basically, I sometimes say it's, but I've been told this a little bit incorrect to say this, but I say, you know, don't drink the Kool-Aid. The reason it's not correct is because Kool-Aid was Jamestown and that was associated with a lot of death and stuff. But when we say don't drink the Kool-Aid, we mean don't buy what they're selling you. So part of an investigation is, is to realize that we are conditioned by our experience. You're conditioned by being a woman, you know, and that makes you a certain way. Uh, yes. So appreciating attachment and trying to intervene in it from the RAIN perspective would decrease the pain. And then the end is for, for non-identify, which is a Buddhist term, but non-identify means you are not defined by what happened to you or what you think or what's going on. You're a, a lot of what you're doing is living in a delusion. So a sense is delusive. And by the way, Buddhism delusion isn't a bad thing per se, the way it might be in, in other ways. It just means you're stuck in a dream, what Tara calls stuck in a trance. Trance it, of unworthiness, she always says. Not, the trance of unworthiness is what she always says. And a lot of other things. So non-identify just means, and it can be quite freeing, I have to say. If you can actually non-identify, you can say, you know, I may not be an asshole. That might be the first step. But you, yes, I am. I have much proof that I'm an asshole. I can talk to you from now until the cows come home, an expression I never fully understood. Tell you why I'm an asshole. But you know, that's just regurgitating the Kool-Aid. So, so, so RAIN is about detecting that you've been catapulted into those situations. So when I was working on the reactive voids model, I wanted something like that. I want to wander away from the dock a little bit on rain because I don't need you to be mindful in the traditional sense. I think it would be groovy if you were, but you don't have to. Many people out there are living much better lives and are much wiser than I am who've never heard of or don't care about mindfulness. Mindfulness is just a bicycle. You know, it works for some people. It doesn't work for others. It can get you somewhere, but it may not. So try to think of how could we use rain again, but use it to mean slightly different things. So Tara Brock was helping me with this, you know, not intimately involved, but I would email her over and over again or text her or talk to her about Tara, who works with trauma. You know, how can we, how can I write about rain? Then I realized probably I wanted to rework it a little bit. So now I'm just going to say the reworking. Okay. So, and then this was originally used for clients. I hope we have enough time for me to make the switch there in a few minutes. But regain was, if you get triggered, what could you do? And like some people are using regain to, they have a, they have a laminated sheet that they have in their, their study or in their kitchen or on their refrigerator, just steps of regain. I even know of people that have shrunk it down to just the words. It's a one-page sheet that you can download, I think, from my website or some other places. But they can even have a little thing that fits in their wallet so that when they get triggered, I know it sounds weird, but you just pull out this little laminated card and it takes you through the steps. So what are the steps? The first step, the R for regain, is recognize that you've been triggered which really isn't that different from the Buddhist notion, but it is much more Western trauma focused. So you have to know you've been triggered. And that takes a lot of work, right? Have you ever been screaming at someone you totally think you're entitled to it? Two hours later, when you calm down, you go, what was that about? Those are the hallmarks of being triggered. Right. So you have to be mildly, mindfully even recognized. And that's why in therapy, recognition, you know, how do you know you've been triggered? Well, when I'm triggered, I feel this way, I act this way, or my actions are out of proportion to the cause, the official cause. Or, you know, those kinds of things. Or I have a minor flashback or I get dizzy or my body starts to hurt. Whatever it is. So recognize you've been triggered. Big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the RE. The G is ground yourself, which isn't in rain. And ground means use the things we can teach you. Breathing, mindful appreciation. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it right now, but I talk about metacognitive self-talk, telling yourself things like, I feel like I'm bad, but I'm not really bad. This is from my childhood. People have so many ways to tell themselves, you know, they'll say, this is the abuse talking, da, 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 da. One of my favorites on one of these things, like what we're doing right now, a woman said, yeah, my favorite is, hi, mom. <laughs> right? So you're you're grounding, though. The minute you say, hi, mom, and mom had her own issues, too. Let's not build a fine mom, but mom may have hurt. Uh, when you say, hi, mom, you're actually doing a tremendous metacognitive leap, aren't you? You're saying, I'm feeling like I'm a piece of whatever, and... Hi, mom. <laughs> really? it came from, it, mom had her own reasons she had to deal with that, but that's where it came from. So many women who call themselves pejorative names for women who have more sex than other people think they should have. Uh, those words that they use, let's not use the words, 
often come from mothers. But it comes from mothers because mothers are vilified for their lack of sexual freedom and their non-entitlement to be whoever they are. And our rules that a James Bond could do all this stuff, but a woman can't do these things. Yeah? So there's all that stuff. So we may have to talk to our brain. That's that's the grounding metacognitive self-talk. Then that next thing, that, so that's R-E-G. The next one is A. And what A stands for is accept that the feelings you have are completely valid. They don't need to be pushed away. It would be really groovy if you could keep from acting on them if acting on them would be a problem which often it is. That's what triggering things generally lead us to. So can I just allow myself to realize I feel ashamed, feel my anger or whatever? Because if I don't, if I try to push that stuff away, both Western psychology and Buddhist psychology says it's going to come back and get us even worse later. So can I allow it at whatever level I can allow? And by the way, we don't say fully allow it in because that's more than a lot of us can handle. But let it in a little bit. Say maybe you don't go get totally in touch with how much you hate yourself, but maybe you can say and this is really making me feel bad about myself. Yeah, and that's reasonable. So accept or allow the experience and then investigate the I. So investigate in rain was you investigate what you're attached to, et cetera, right? So that you can do something about it. Investigation in regain means, can I figure out where this is coming from? Which is in the earlier steps too. But I find for myself and for my clients and for my friends, the more we can investigate, the more unreal our activations are. The more you realize it's coming from your father's sexually abusive behavior or uh, your mother's abusive behavior or your father's disengagement, non-response to your pain when you were little, and the more you can say that, you're doing a huge metacognitive step because you're saying, although I feel these ways, it's not about now, it's about then. And that, that's what Tara calls waking up from the trance. You know, So you're, so, so this, this step of investigation, so it's a little bit different, right? So yeah. in therapy, this would be investigating where does this stuff come from? And then non-identification, the last step would be just because I was abused doesn't mean I'm bad. Just because I was told these things, just because I'm gay, trans, white, black, small, tall, people think I have too much adipose tissue or not enough adipose tissue. But the ratio between my eyes, my nose, and my forehead, which the anthropologists have shown is how we determine what attractiveness is. But that's just bullshit. And the more that we can start to to realize that we've drank the Kool-Aid and it's not our fault because that's all we had to drink and we were dying of thirst, that that's, that's the freedom component. That's a potential freedom. It takes forever, but the more we can start to realize, hey, this isn't real. So non-identification is that last step. So in reactive avoidance model, like I have a whole chapter on this in this new book about how to teach the client regain. It's not just something you do once. They might want to spend session after session talking about painful feelings, feeling the feelings, and then regaining it in the session with you, giving you a chance. Think of all the things you can cover around re- recognizing what happened to you and what's going on with you soothing yourself, grounding yourself, accepting your experience without pushing it away, but not letting it overwhelm you, figuring out where it came from, and then starting to say, you know what? This isn't me. This is not my thing. This is something that's been imposed imposed on me. Where would we be if we could all regain? Where would we be if we didn't identify with what the culture has taught us since we were born? We'd probably be in, uh, I don't have a clue what that state would be like, but we'd be <laughs> probably utopia, <laughs> where we've all been trying to get to. <laughs> well, that's what, you know, it feels the, thank you for explaining those and the differences between the two, rain and regain. I really appreciate that. Then I've used rain a lot and I like, I kind of feel like the way I've used it is more like regain because it's maybe just innately yes, because of my are. being a trauma therapist. It's just the yeah, way that yeah. it made felt right. That's but- what Tara, so Tara says that is what it is. You know, it's just that it has a bigger thing too in the Buddhist community. But yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Yeah. I mean, naming the grounding is one of the big pieces. I think like we have to stop, but I feel like with therapists, when we get into an enactment, when our activation When our traumatic material or attachment wounds get activated and we don't know it and we're in the session and the client is reacting to us or reacting to themselves at us and we think that we need to engage in, you can't talk to me that way or whatever like that. And I was thinking about, I wish we had time to go into it. Maybe I can have you come back sometime in the future if you're ever willing. But thinking about when client, when I'm going to, this is like me doing a doorknob moment because we have to stop and it's like when. (laughs) When therapists, when clients start doing sexually provocative behaviors or begin sexualizing the therapist or something and the therapist has any kind of a sexual violence history, which for female identifying therapists, almost all of us do because it's like such a ubiquitous part of being female. And there's so many therapists who are 
female identity. The way our culture treats yeah, objectification with or by being female, you know, even if you, I worked in sexual abuse for 30 years, you know, there are a lot of sexual abuse survivors who never actually had anything happen to them, but they were sexualized from an early age. They were diminished. They were, I'm cutting into your time, sorry. No, no, you're right. You're right. A hundred percent. So even beyond actual any touching or any physical contact of sexualization, there can be so many other ways. Yes, it's so. You're helping me want to say something that I really appreciate. It's all right if I say on your word. No, of course. I know I said we have to stop, but you can still keep talking. (laughs) We work uh, a lot with my wife and I have developed an entire evidence-based program for working with multi-traumatized inner city kids. And these are socially marginalized kids. We've been doing that for many years. You can go on my website and read about some of that stuff. You know, refing, if you are a victim of racism and then someone's racist with you right now, if your client's sexualizing you right now, your reaction doesn't have to be regained on one. Some of it doesn't because you're just reacting appropriately to racism or sexism or transphobia or whatever it might yeah. be. So it's really important in the longer, when we talk about this, and I hope we'll talk about it in Cancun, is probably any trigger you run into does have to do with a real thing. People yeah. trigger you, they are being a little bit to you. Or they're infantilizing you or they're sexualizing you or they're diminishing you because of your skin color or who you love or whatever it might be. And that is not what we're regaining. So I, I'm really grateful that you brought that up. Regaining is, because I've worked with a number of activists and we've had to talk about this over and over again. A lot of activists have said to me at the beginning of therapy, I'm afraid therapy will take away my anger and now I won't be able to be a good activist. Well, and what I try to say, I hope that you'll find out that you'll be less angry and that will make you a better activist. Because your anger, part of it is completely valid. It's all valid, but yeah. part of it's valid because of you and your sisters and brothers and 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 less binary identified beings out there are struggling with this stuff, and that's totally appropriate. But there's also the other piece, and so that's the that's the part we were getting. So you're sitting with your client, and they're looking at your breasts, or they're or they're. My favorite is we talk often talk about sexualizing. I think there's maternalizing, where you make the female therapist be your mother, which is drives women crazy from what they've told me, or they try to treat you in a sexist way to try to control the narrative because it's too upsetting to them when they think you have too much power. That's going to be very triggering if you have those kinds of dynamics. So can you regain yourself? And that's the part I left out. And thank you. So I, the, the, what this workshop is about is mostly about using regain for yourself. Now, when you do it early on, it could take five minutes and you don't have five minutes in the average session. So you're going to have to figure out how you fit that in. But if you do it a lot, I regain in maybe five seconds, 10 seconds, because I just go right through. Am I triggered? Yes. Uh, can I call myself? Well, what could I do right now? Take a deep breath. Take it easy. You know, uh, find that place for meditation that I can drop into in this very grounding and a little bit of quantum, uh, you know, then right away, can I allow myself to have that experience? Can I see that that's from my multiple fathers and all the other people? And I lived in some difficult circumstances early in life. Can I see this? That's where this is coming from. And then can I not identify with that story? You can do that in 15 seconds. The other way you can do it, by the way, is you can do it over the entire session, which is you just do a little bit. <laughs> you know, they trigger you and you just do a little bit of recognition. I've been triggered. And maybe split to the uh, investigation. I'm triggered because I've seen this before. Mm. And then maybe say to yourself, you know, whatever. But then maybe later in the session, you can work on other parts of it. Because none of this is about going through an algorithm of just A, B, C, D. You may go R, A, N, B, <laughs> R. Because you're going to keep moving through those things throughout the session. It's not one activation, is it? I like to say that we are yeah. constantly our world. I think we're triggered hundreds of times an hour. I think you and I have triggered each other a lot. But the problem is what we think triggering means a bad thing. Then that sounds like, oh, I'm sorry I triggered you. But what if we're just, tri- can anyone just be completely objective in any relational environment? Or are we always going to call on our history and our background? Right. It's either a positive association or yeah. neutral or uncomfortable. So my mother is 94 and she's still around, but she's dementing and has been for a while. I notice in consultations, I tend to want to diminish the amount of suffering that my that these people are in because I don't want them to suffer as much as my mother. So if I can think they're not suffering or I can try to make them be healthier. I've done in consultations, I do a therapist, you know, Fred, it's, it's adorable you're doing this, but I think that you're trying to have your client be better off than he or she really or they really are because... You don't want them to suffer. What could be more wonderful than that? But unfortunately, that's an activation too. And it may mean that you're not providing the level of help you could for that person because you're not wanting to see how much they suffer. Okay. I just have to say, thank you so much for what you added, what you added on about Regain after my question, because 
Actually, that came up to mind, too, about, well, what if the client is acting out racism and you are in a marginalized identity that they're speaking about or it's activating something for you? And I would hope that you would say you don't have to, you know, that's OK if you're being triggered by that. You don't have to, like, you know, not, you know, protect yourself or whatever. But we didn't really go into that. But, yeah, so it's it, like there are things. So for the. Residents I work with who are in any devalued category. When you add women to devalued categories, that's like uh, you know ninety percent of the human population. I actually tell them it's okay to say what you're saying sounds racist to me, and it and it makes me upset. I think you can go that far. I don't think you can go. Hey, let me tell you how I'm upset. Right. I think you, you can set people. a boundary. That's right. And you can say stuff like that. I think it's perfectly fine. I, I think, think it's think appropriate. I think it would be somewhat racist. Or too much of a sexist person, you quit therapy too. I mean, it's you yeah. need to make sure you know why you're doing. It. You're not acting out, right? But nobody says you 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 were born so that you could work with people who hate people like you, right? You don't have to allow the client to abuse you. And if it's if you feel like you're like I can work with this and I can still keep working with this person, you can do that. But if you feel like this is unsafe for me and I'm needing to refer out, that's the appropriate thing to do too. Yeah, I'm really glad you you raised that issue. Thank you. And I'll just make a quick last point, which is to the example I was raising about the sexualization, I was thinking about if a if this, and I was thinking about it more in a subtle way because I've been, I'll tell you this real fast. One time in a training, we were doing a demo and I was playing the therapist and the other therapist who was in the training was playing the client. And we were working on attachment stuff and they, I won't say they sexualized me, but they're, they're, the energy in our dynamic while we were doing this practice changed to where there was a romantic feeling. Mm-hmm. It felt like they were feeling a romantic feeling toward me all of a sudden. And I felt it and I felt myself get like pulled into something and I knew something was happening, but I didn't know what it was. Cause I was like, what is this? Yes, of course. And, and I think with regain, it's an opportunity to, I could have said if I had this tool, what's happening right now? I was like, what's happening, but I didn't know what it was. And I also didn't have, we the- have to be so gentle with ourselves because yeah. mostly if we're not dealing with reality, I think we're mostly in a non-real state. So we'd have to be doing that. It'd be crazy all the time. You know? And if the activation causes us to relive our history, then we're not in the adult competent right. therapist woman. We're in maybe the abused little girl or what, or what, or the something art. in my history that I didn't even know. Right. Yeah. So of course you're not going to recognize that right away. This is not, this is, you know, therapy is the art of the possible and, and self-exploration is the art of the possible. You just do the best you can. You know, and frankly, we men have been trained to sexualize intimacy. So it's perfectly logical if the person was a man, was the person a man, that they're going to sexualize it. Well, okay, but it could have been sexualize it because they don't actually know. What, I mean, I say this with compassion for men, but I feel bad how much we've hurt people with it. They sexualize, we sexualize intimacy unless we've worked on it for a long time. So what's the, what's the person supposed to do? Right. Like a different circuit got activated. Right. And then, you know, and then I was, I would have gone right. Like if this was a therapy session, I, thought about it i was like oh this is a real therapy session how would i have interacted like because it was so i was confused about Mm -hmm. what was happening and i didn't have anything to grab onto about why would this be happening other than i could tell it just felt like the person was flirting with me and i i felt like the first reaction was like to flirt back and then i was like no that's not it i don't know what to do here but i'm just trying to pretend this isn't happening or you know, and so it's just like, so I can see how even after that, I could have gone and taken this tool, Regain, I could have worked with it right then, after, or in the moment yeah. I had the wherewithal, but I didn't. When we stay with clients and with therapists, the minute something doesn't seem right, Regain. It's that simple. If the minute that you feel shame or anger or sexual arousal, or you feel like you're being victimized, whatever it is, you don't have to make a judgment about that. That just tells you drop into Brigade. Yeah. So maybe it would turn out that nothing was going on. Maybe you were projecting something onto him if we want to use that old word, but or her. But that's not, and so, who cares? I mean, yeah. the reality is that's what Brigade is about. Uh, exactly. I just have to tell you that Judy Herman, the famous feminist I'll interview Judy Herman, too, if you want to put in a word. Hey, just tell all your friends. <laughs> She's a little hard to, to reach, I think. Uh, she and I were on a panel for the American Psychiatric Association. It was around the false memory stuff. And someone in the audience, a guy who was known for believing this was all false memories, said, and said, I want to ask you two a question. What would you do if someone came into your room 
and told you they'd been abducted by space aliens and had all their organs removed and then put back in a different order. Because he wanted us to say, well, I would, and Judy and I both said in our own way, we said, I would say, welcome to therapy. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Not, you're right. You're wrong. Get those organs in the right order. So with, with regaining, it's just like, ah, yeah. triggered as I always am, but this one's producing some. See, I would say that the fact that you felt weird and knew you felt weird is mindfulness. Yeah. Because how many people would have just done what you were thinking about doing that the Kool-Aid had taught them to do? Right. Well, it, that's, I think, only because it was in a training with a demo where there was a, an assistant who said, let's pause for a second. What's happening? And I go, this is an enactment. I don't know what it is, but that's what I know. And they were like, yes. So I don't know what would have happened. That's the thing. It was a beautiful training experience because it was a snapshot that gave me an experience to go, wow, I got to reflect on this. Be curious that's about the hardest this. Work, I mean, like that, that example is the hardest work. Activation of attachment schema are by definition non-cognitive. So you don't know what's going on. I would love to talk about that. I write about that a lot. Implicit memory, it's nonverbals. So you don't know what's going on. That stuff happened before you were born. A lot of it already happened. No, not before you were born. Before you got verbal language at four or five, you'd already in- incorporated all this nonverbal stuff. Attachment schema take take over and it's very hard to get out of. And then if you add to that, that any of it is reminiscent of acts of commission, like when someone did stuff to you, you're going to be stuck. So that wasn't like 101. That was advanced studies in... <laughs> Yeah. Whatever. Well, that's why I love experiential trainings. And just to mention again that you're doing this training in Cancun and people can learn more from you about these these concepts and this and working with these five acting out defense reactive avoidance strategies. Can I say, by the way, that yeah, if you some people have heard me talk, I don't give lectures in a very didactic way. I try to treat it as a collegial interaction between people roughly at the same level, which, so if you do go to that, I, you don't need to go to that, but if you did go to that, it would be, I would be talking to you about what to do about the problem technically, and then we spend the second half on what to do about your reaction, to it, which actually helps the problem further. But it, it's, we'll just be sitting around talking about these things, and I'll be as self-disclosive as I am now. We have to model those kinds of that forms of education, you know, that that's actually the good stuff. Who wants to go to a workshop where some talking head talks? Exactly. You know? Well, I'm so grateful that you shared this time with me today, and I really would love to have you come back sometime if you ever would like to. And But where can people learn more? You mentioned your website before, but tell us where people can find all of the things that you're doing. You have so many books, and you teach so much. Again, I'm going to have to look at the book. Let me just show you the book. Boy, I hit it when authors do this, but this is called uh, Treating Risky and Compulsive Behavior and Sexual Trauma Survivors. And I, don't, I think it was published in 2019 by Guilford. So if you wanted to hear about the stuff we're talking about here, and it has a huge mindfulness component. And that's actually the book that Tara gave it, that we worked out the regain on. That would be something you could do, but don't buy it. to take it out of the library. The other thing is... Uh, <laughs> you old hippie. <laughs> what? Abby Hoffman, <laughs> steal this book. <laughs> Just go to a library. But and the other thing is just on my website, everything's free. And some of it's in violation of copyright with different journals and stuff. But you can download most of my stuff that I've ever written other than the books in there, including I would recommend the two chapters on using mindfulness and trauma therapy. Maybe that would be helpful. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I will link to your website in the show notes. And of course, for anyone who's interested in attending this training coming up, that link will be in the show notes as well. But John, Dr. Breer, thank you so much for being my guest today. My, fa- my second father was a doc- Dr. Breer, and so I don't like being called that. Okay. John, <laughs> thank you so much for being my guest. Sure. It was really a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached and see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Want to learn more from John Briere about new interventions for treating complex trauma in adolescents and adults? Then don't miss his five-day workshop in Cancun this February. Use promo code JOHN50 at leadingedgecancun.com when you register for his workshop to save 50% on your hotel room when you book it at the same time. 
That's a savings of up to $1,500. Register today for 50% off accommodations when you book John's workshop at the same time using code JOHN50 at leadingedgecancun.com. New registrations only. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.